Uh, to start today's program, it's my pleasure to introduce to you the president and CEO of the Museum of Flight, Doug King. Doug? Thank you, Cale. It, it's always an honor for me to stand in this theater and represent the museum, but um, particularly today. I, I think that um, all of you who understand what an ACE is knows how very special it is to have one here. Um, there were only 1,500 flyers in the history of, of air combat who shot down five enemy aircraft. This started clear back in World War I, and today is the last ACE. Unless warfare changes again, and air to air combat is pretty much done for at least the foreseeable future, and with us today was the last person to earn that honor. Of those 1,500 aces, only about 70 remain alive today. And I had the amazing honor to meet more than half of them at a ceremony in Washington, D.C. back in May. The Congress of the United States awards two gold medals each year to great Americans for their achievements in, on behalf of our country. This is more than a 150-year-old tradition. There are only two a year. These don't just go to military people, they go to people who've contributed in other ways, to the civil rights movement, uh, to people who've moved our country forward diplomatically. Um, they, they go all the way back, frankly, to George Washington. And, but there's tremendous competition for those two each year because they're obviously an awful lot of deserving people. So we were thrilled to participate with many of the friends in the room and others around the country in convincing the Congress that one group that needed to be honored now, um, a group that's shrinking, was the American Fighter Aces. And so when the Congress passed that bill last year, I had the honor to stand in the President's office with four of the Aces while he signed the bill. Maybe even more impressive was the award ceremony of the medal itself to the Aces in the Capitol this last May where we saw the four leaders of Congress from both parties, from both houses, stand together. How often does that ever happen, <laughs> no matter what anybody's politics are, that all of our nation's leaders, the president, the speaker of the house, the president of the Senate, the minority leaders, stand together and say thank you to a group of people for what they've done for our country. Well, we're thrilled that one of those people that was honored that night is here today. Um, Steve Ritchie started in Reedsville, North Carolina. His Air Force career was as a cadet at the Air Force Academy in the class of 1964, where he was a starting halfback. The Falcons played their final, his final game was actually in the Gator Bowl. You know, that Air Force team is pretty darn good this year, Steve, so watch out. Uh, in 1965, he graduated first in his class in Air Force pilot training at Laredo Air Force Base in Texas, and in 69 became one of the youngest instructors ever at the Air Force Top Gun Fighter Weapons School at Nellis Air Force Base. In 1968, he flew his first combat mission, his first combat tour in Vietnam in an F-4. You can see an F-4 here in our great gallery. Unfortunately, it doesn't look a lot like the one Steve flew because it's a Navy version. It's actually in Blue Angels um, livery. But just outside here, you can see a picture, not just of a, an F-4, but the one that Steve flew, a beautiful poster, which by the way, are available in our gift shop, uh, that shows his actual aircraft and commemorates what he did on his second tour in Vietnam, where he became the first person in history to, to down five MiG-21 enemy fighters, a record that will never be equaled. On August 28th, 1972, he became America's last fighter ace. Uh, during his Air Force career, he logged more than 4,000 hours, including 800 in combat, in 339 missions in Southeast Asia. He left active duty in 1974, but continued to serve in the Air Force Reserve and the Air National Guard, holding important positions at Air Force headquarters in the Pentagon. He retired in 1999 after six years as a mobilization assistant to the commander of the Air Force Recruiting Services. He was one of the few second lieutenants selected to fly the F-104 Starfighter immediately following his initial pilot training, and he's the only person ever to be recertified to fly a Starfighter 40 years later. His awards include the five combat uh, victories that I mentioned that made him an ace, but also the Air Force Cross, four silver stars, 10 distinguished flying crosses, and 25 air medals. But none of those may be his most prized uh, possession, if you will, because tonight he, he's accompanied by his wife, Mariana, who will also be speaking to you. You know, while Steve was 
flying American fighter jets to preserve our freedom. She was in Romania. She grew up under communism, hoping that American fighter jets would come someday to free her and take her to America. Steve speaks on what it's like to fight communism. Mariana talks about what it's like to live under communist oppression. This dynamic duo has been inspiring to us all every time we've heard them in the way that they spread an infectious love for the American dream. So let's start first with a video that can tell a bit more about Steve better than I did. And thank you all, excuse me, thank you all for being here. Brigadier General Steve Ritchie, United States Air Force. Brigadier General Steve Ritchie is an accomplished pilot, businessman, and motivational speaker. As a command pilot with more than 4,000 flying hours, including 800 in combat, General Ritchie is the first and only Air Force pilot ace since the Korean War and the only American pilot in history to down five MiG-21s. Born in Reedsville, North Carolina, Steve Ritchie was an honor student and football standout as a high school quarterback. Ritchie entered the Air Force Academy in 1960, graduating in 64 with a B.S. in engineering science. While there, he was a football walk-on and made the team as a starting halfback for the Falcons, playing his final game in the 1963 Gator Bowl. Ritchie then entered pilot training at Laredo, Texas, and graduated first in his class. His initial assignment was at Eglin Air Force Base, Florida, flying F-104 Starfighters. In 1968, Ritchie served as an F-4 aircraft commander at Da Nang Air Base, Vietnam, where he flew the first F-4 fast forward air controller mission in Vietnam. He was instrumental in the spread of the fast FAC program throughout Southeast Asia. It proved to be one of the most successful operations of the entire conflict. In 1969, he completed the Air Force Top Gun Fighter Weapons School in the Phantom and became one of the youngest instructors in the history of the school. Ritchie volunteered for a second tour in Southeast Asia in 1972 and compiled an aviation record that will likely never be equaled. He shot down a MiG-21 on May 10th and another on May 31st. He downed two more MiG-21s on July 8th in a classic low-altitude dogfight that lasted 89 seconds. Steve was victorious again on August 28th while flying his 339th combat mission, making him the Air Force's first and only pilot ace since the Korean War and the only American pilot in history to down five MiG-21s. At the urging of Senator Barry Goldwater, then Major Ritchie left active duty in April 1974 to run for U.S. House of Representatives from his home state of North Carolina. Thereafter, he worked as special assistant to Joseph Coors for the next six years and was promoted to lieutenant colonel while serving in the Colorado Air National Guard. Ritchie transferred to the Air Force Reserves in 1985, holding positions in the Pentagon. In 1994, he was promoted to brigadier general and served as mobilization assistant to the commander of Air Force recruiting. In 1997, Ritchie flew an active duty F-4E Phantom at the Air Force 50th anniversary show and has flown the only privately owned Phantom more than 100 times at air shows and special events. He is currently the only pilot to be FAA type rated in the F-104 Starfighter, more than 40 years after having flown the world's fastest low-altitude jet. Today, General Ritchie travels, speaking about aviation, national security, and America's free market system as president of Steve Ritchie Associates, Inc., Brigadier General Ritchie is one of the most decorated pilots in Air Force history, having been awarded the Air Force Cross, four Silver Stars, ten Distinguished Flying Crosses, and 25 Air Medals. Well, my goodness. After a catapult like that, if I can't get airborne, I'm in trouble, wouldn't you say? Thank you, Doug. Thank you for the film. Uh, my mother did a nice job on the film, don't you think? Yeah. yeah. She, I, I, I wish she had uh, lived long enough to see that film. That was done for um, American Combat Airmen's Hall of Fame out in Midland, Texas, a few years ago. So I uh, did get to fly that great starfighter uh, again 40 years after having flown it as a second lieutenant and uh, finished, uh, finished that about two years ago, did the last flight in the Starfighter about two years ago when I was 70. So 
Very blessed to have uh, been able to fly fighter airplanes for about 50 years. But um, uh, now Dad was in uh, Patton's Third Army in Europe in World War II, so uh, I don't think he would have believed much of that film, but, uh, <laughs> but I do appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, Doug, I want to thank you and the film for not telling the score of that Air Force Carolina football game in the Gator Bowl of 63. Uh, uh, I doubt if there's anyone here old enough to remember that. I've been trying to forget it for, let's see now, 52 years this coming December 28th, I think it was. I was a halfback out at the Air Academy. This last game took place against one of my home state teams, University of North Carolina, and I just thought that'd be the greatest way in the world to end 11 years of organized football. Well, as tradition would have it, after the game, they gave us a watch. It had a little football and an alligator in the middle of it. Every time I looked at mine, it read 35 to nothing. <laughs> Sir, don't blame you for not laughing. No, that was the score of the ball game. Yeah, we didn't think it was too funny either. Now, that season was not a total loss. We don't have any Nebraska fans here that would have... Oops. <laughs> and you admit it. <laughs> You're not going to like this story. <laughs> we, meaning this little Air Force team, traveled to Lincoln, Nebraska, the fall of 63, about mid-October. Nebraska was undefeated and nationally ranked. We were unranked. We didn't have a chance of being ranked. We are outweighed over 50 pounds per person. We won that game in the last two minutes. Now think about it. <laughs> to beat the Big Red in Lincoln, when they're undefeated and in the top 10, we had to get out of town in a hurry. <laughs> and it's the only game Nebraska lost 63 season. They beat Auburn in the Orange Bowl. They ended up number five in the nation. We denied them the national championship. Some people like to applaud at this point. <laughs> Having to work for it, aren't I? <laughs> So, the impossible is sometimes possible, right? There was no way. We had absolutely no chance. It was totally impossible. And somehow we did it. The impossible is sometimes possible. You know what? It's virtually impossible that, that I would have been a fighter ace. I don't know how. A lot of us survived. In my case, 339 missions, 800 hours of combat. But I do know that there's so many things that had to fall into place that were almost impossible for me to have downed five MiG-21s. And I didn't know until today that one of my dearest friends and colleagues from those days who flew with me in combat was going to be here at the program. He's here with his son and granddaughter. His name is John Madden. He's here with son John and daughter Audrey. And uh, John and I were in our Air Force Top Gun School together. And then uh, he was assigned to Udorn, Thailand uh, a few months after I was in 1972. So I was already in a position to lead flights over North Vietnam. And John came along just a little bit later. And John volunteered to fly number three for me. That's a deputy flight leader. And for those of you who know anything about combat flying, that is critical. Because it's the leader that's a shooter, and it's the other three that protect the leader. Now, we all, um, our most important tenet is, is mutual support. In other words, protecting each other. So our job as a flight of four was to protect all of us. We flew in elements of one and two and three and four, and three was the leader of the second element and the deputy flight leader. If something happened to the leader, number three took over. 
But part of my job was try to protect the second element, and a big part of the second element's job was to protect the lead element. So I was lucky enough to have downed a couple of victories, and, and there, those are long, long stories. I wouldn't even schedule to be on the mission for the victory number one. I wouldn't, wasn't even going to be on that mission. I was flying a fast pack mission that day. And a classmate of mine, Bob Lodge, um, who'd actually been a student of mine, John, when I was an IP at the weapons school, was leading that mission. Um, Bob had two victories at that point. He was one of the smartest guys in our class. He'd been pr uh, promoted to major three years early. He was a major. We were captains. He was what's called the wing weapons officer, in other words, the expert in the wing on the employment of our weapons systems. And Bob had been planning this, uh, this mission for months. And the deputy flight leader, number three, was a squadron ops officer, a lieutenant colonel, uh, senior to Bob, except on the mission. On the mission, he was junior to the flight leader because he was number three. So about five minutes till 5 a.m., which was when we briefed the mission, Bob saw me in the hall. He, he said, Steve, Colonel Cooper's not here. If he doesn't show up at 5 exactly when the second hand sweeps the 12, the door shuts, the briefing starts. And if you're not there, you don't go on the briefing. He said, do you want to take this mission? I said, you bet I do. And so he told the schedule, he said, if Colonel Cooper's not here at 5 a.m., Richie, you get somebody to fly Richie's mission, he's going with us, and sure enough. Colonel Cooper had too much to drink the night before. He overslept. Showed up at the squadron, I don't know, 5, 10, or 15. He didn't even think about coming into the room because it was one of his rules. <laughs> you know, I talk to students about the importance of being on time for class because so many don't believe that's important to be on time for class or anywhere else. And Lieutenant Colonel Mike Cooper was late for class that day, and nobody's ever heard of him. And Steve Ritchie's in the history books. It's important to be on time for class. So uh, as time went by, well, unfortunately, that day, Bob Blodger was shot down. So I had flown on the 8th of May, John, I don't know if you remember this, I'd flown as number four with Bob Lodge, and Mike Cooper was flying three that day, where Bob shot down his second MiG. And uh, Colonel Cooper and I had a shot at a MiG, and Cooper fired everything he had, and of course that Sparrow missile only had an 11% PK probability of kill, so uh, it lived up to its reputation that day and didn't, didn't hit. And he cleared me to fire, and I was below bingo, which is our go-home fuel. And we really preached to everybody. The flight leader was very, very serious about when we hit bingo, we stop and we go, we go home. And here I was a little bit below bingo <laughs> and that MiG is out there not maneuvering very hard and I wanted so badly, John, <laughs> to take a shot at that guy, but I did the right thing and said, I'm, I'm bingo. And we went home. And uh, I kicked myself in the rear end for a couple of days thinking that's the only time I'd ever have a shot at an enemy airplane, and I blew it, even though I did the right thing. So I went from number four to number three because Cooper got drunk and didn't show up, ended up downing my first MiG-21, and unfortunately Bob Lodge, our leader, was shot down. And the next day, I found myself as flight leader and wing weapons officer. I went from four to three to one 
in two days. From then on, I led missions over the north. And then John Madden volunteered to fly number three for me. And I began to say to John, John, you, you're ready to lead flights. You should be leading these flights. He said, no, Steve, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to support you. He used to say, Steve, it's just a matter of time. And uh, I knew better than that because any day, any one of us could have been shot down and killed or captured. So it wasn't just a matter of time. And uh, sure enough, it happened, was somehow lucky enough to down the fifth MiG-21, and then John led flights after that and ended up with two or three more. How many, John? Two, three, three and four, three and, a, three, and, three and a half. You see, if John had listened to me <laughs> and, and led flights when I said he should have, John would probably be speaking to you here today, not Steve Ritchie. He was loyal to me, and it resulted in my being able to be a fighter ace. And uh, I can't tell you how much that means. And I'm so surprised and glad that John is here today. Thank you, sir. Any uh, Navy and Marines here? Now, I always get this mixed up all these years. Is the Navy a part of the Marines? <laughs> what is it? Which way? Which way? Hmm? Navy, Navy, Navy beat us this year, but we beat Army. Uh, somebody in the Navy was telling me earlier that, I mean, the Marines, that they represented the men's department of the Navy. <laughs> No? I, you said that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's an old one. Well, maybe you've heard this one. I had a chance to fly with one of these Marines one time. We got some bad weather. We had to make an instrument approach in the field. We finally broke out on the weather. He tried to land on a runway that was 150 feet long and 10,000 feet wide. <laughs> Sir, that's 150 feet long. Yeah. I think he got that one. Another reason that I'm happy to be here, April of 1972, I really shouldn't have made it. There's the football team. Let's see. There was a, I was a senior and there was a big fight to get on the front row. <laughs> there are all my classmates on the front row and I didn't make it. <laughs> Ended up on the second row. But, uh, Great All-American quarterback named Terry Isaacson, he's the one that engineered that great drive and pass play that won the game uh, at Nebraska. Um, Al McCarter was the backup quarterback. He became a Thunderbird Air Force air demonstration team, as opposed to the Blue Angels. Uh, then became a senior vice president at FedEx. Then started his own airline called Allegiant Airline out of Love Field in Dallas for a few years. Then became administrator of the FAA. He and I had the honor of serving in the Reagan administration together. And for quite some time now, he's been the number two man at Airbus Worldwide. Underachiever. <laughs> but a wonderful guy. I got to room with him on football trips way back in the day. And uh, we have so many, uh, for some reason, in the class of 64 that are like McCarter. 
I feel like I do about John, so privileged to have uh, been able to study and work and learn with these great American leaders. Um, let's go back a minute. So anyway, another reason, happy to be here. April of 1972, I really shouldn't have made it. On my very first mission over Hanoi, 16 April 72, there were three SAMs, surface air missile about the size of a telephone pole. They were accelerated up at our airplanes at, what, John, 15, 1,600 miles an hour. They proximity fuse detonate, be lethal, be deadly within about 150 feet. And on my very first mission, three of them came within about 100 feet of our airplane, failed to go off, <laughs> failed to detonate. Thank goodness for that Soviet quality control. <laughs> but there were many other times and really hit and not been for thousands, tens of thousands of people in the entire military and civilian support community who were proud of their work, who performed it in a professional and outstanding manner. Steve Ritchie would not be a fighter ace, and I probably would not be alive. So as you can imagine, I'm pretty thankful, pretty grateful. I feel very fortunate to receive so much of the credit that belongs to so many who helped make it all possible. There are many fighter pilots who could have done what I did. But we had a unique opportunity in the air combat arena. And there were some reasons for our success at the time, given that opportunity. And you know what they are. Preparation, teamwork, discipline, dedication, education, training, communication, enthusiasm, enthusiasm, <laughs> attitude, 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 will, determination, integrity, and surely most will agree that those are the elements, the ingredients, the keys that go into the makeup of what? Success, achievement, quality, excellence, top gun performance, in anything that we do, personal or professional. So in the final analysis, it's people in a wide array of support functions who are trained and motivated and ready and willing to do the job, who ultimately make it possible for us to win rather than to lose, to su succeed rather than to fail, and sometimes to live rather than to die. And that gets to be pretty important, doesn't it? General Patton said, we fight with machinery, but we win with people. We win with people. And I really am convinced that people can and will do great things. They'll reach for the stars when motivated by inspired leadership. I'd like to tell you for just a few minutes about three of the great leaders that I had the wonderful privilege to fly with and work for. The wing commander at Udorn, Thailand in 1972 was a young colonel named Charlie Gabriel. Ten years later, he was the chief of our Air Force. The vice wing commander was Jerry O'Malley. He became the vice chief, was commander of Pacific Air Force, then commander of Tactical Air Command when he was tragically killed in an airplane accident in the spring of 1985. He would surely have been the chief. There was an Army One Star there with whom we worked. Began his career in the enlisted ranks of the Minnesota National Guard. Became chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Jack Vesey. These three people, these three individuals had that I don't know what you call it. I talk about it so much, I don't know what to name it. It's that special quality, I guess, that inspires the desire for excellence in almost everyone who's around them. You know people like that? We'd have done almost anything for Charlie Gable, Jerry O'Malley, Jack Vesey. And I know a lot of people find this next statement hard to understand. Maybe some of you will. Maybe you know it to be true. I would have died for them. So would many of my colleagues. And some did. So 
some did. That's a pretty special brand of loyalty, isn't it? Because I'll tell you what, there are a lot of people I don't feel that way about. <laughs> a whole lot of people. What is it? Have you thought about it very much? What is it that commands such loyalty? Well, a part of it is we admired them, we respected them, we loved them. We did. We'd have done almost anything for them. And yet, maybe more important than anything else, we knew that loyalty cut both ways. We knew when things really got tight, when we got into a jam, into a bind, we could count on them just as much as they knew they could count on us. That loyalty cut both ways. And it's so important for us to think about what is it in others that inspires us to do our best and to be our best, and then try to be that way for those who look to us for leadership and guidance and counsel and inspiration. It's kind of like the author who wrote, I love you no, no matter for what you are, but for what I am when I'm around you. Not only for what you are, but for what I am when I'm around you. Don't you see? We were better people when we were around Charlie Gable, Jerry O'Malley, Jack Bessie. We did a better job. We worked harder, communicated better, more creative, more productive. You know what else? We had a heck of a lot more fun, because it is fun to work for people like that. Those of us in leadership and management and supervisory positions have such important responsibilities, because we have either a very positive, a very mediocre, or a very negative effect on people and the lives of people. That's what? Performance, productivity, creativity, communication, Bottom line, mission accomplishment. And it's more important today than it's ever been, isn't it? When we need to be as productive as we can be, in most cases now with fewer resources. Never been more important than it is right now. Bill Danforth, the founder of Ralston Purina, always used to challenge the people in his company to stand tall, to think tall, to smile tall, and to live tall. Aren't these the kind of people we have in the room here today? Why? Because you're up, you're proud, you're happy, you're courteous, you're creative, you communicate better. You like to work. I know. I know it's a new concept in many quarters these days, unfortunately, isn't it? You like to work. And that spirit, that spirit is contagious. In the score for Vagabond King, Rudolf Fremmel wrote, Give me ten who are stout-hearted. And soon I'll give you 10,000 more. That spirit is contagious. Now, many ask about the 8th of July, 1972, when we downed two MiG-21s in a minute and 29 seconds, because it's such a great example of how all of the elements of the team effort come together to produce an incredible victory. The last thing that happened that morning before we taxied is a crew chief came up the ladder let me know we didn't have any film for the camera. <laughs> we're an F4E model with a gun and a gun camera. Most of the time I was in a D model without a gun camera. I said, what do you mean, chief, there's no film? He said, we're out of film. There's no film on base. Thought about that for a moment. I said, that, that's okay. I doubt we'll see MiGs today anyway. See, we never know, do we? We never know what's just around the corner. That's why it's so important to be as prepared as we can possibly be in every area in our lives, because we never know and we need to be ready. Whether we like it or not, whether the main media likes it or not, whether Republicans and Democrats and conservatives and liberals like it or not, whether high school teachers and college professors like it or not. As most of you know, we're in combat. It's a war of good versus evil, right versus wrong, freedom versus slavery, civilization versus chaos, and we must not fail. Think about the fact that tens of millions of young people all over the world are being taught 
to hate us and to kill us, to convert us, or to eliminate us. They can chop off our heads and put it on television and brag about it all over the world. And as Paul Harvey used to say, we have to tiptoe around their sensibilities. How many times is it going to take what happened in France yesterday for us to get our act together all over the world? Ladies and gentlemen, we must not fail. Let me spend just a few more minutes, and we'll get to the best part. I'll tell you about the most thrilling and exciting and challenging and heartwarming mission that I ever flew, where an even greater team effort resulted in a much greater victory. And it was the rescue of Roger Locker, L-O-C-H-E-R. Roger Locker was shot down on the 10th of May in 1972, and for 22 days there was no word. We carry survival radios right here in our survival vest, one on each side, lots of extra batteries. Because there's no way to make that rescue without the communication link. Proper communication is so important in every single thing that we do, every day, all day long, isn't it? Think about the problems caused, the time, the money, the effort, the resources wasted by miscommunication. It's unbelievable. We went back in that afternoon and called and called on the radio. There was no answer. Went in for days thereafter. There was never any reply. We finally decided that he, well, he must have been killed or captured. Yet he never came out on a captured list that the North Vietnamese like to publish every few days. Well, 22 days later, we're flying in the same area. There's a break in the radio chatter. Call came over the air. You can imagine we're 20 or 30 airplanes all on the same frequency, all trying to talk at the same time, particularly when they're shooting at you. It does get a little busy, would you guess? So there's a break in the radio chatter. Call came over the air. Any Allied aircraft? This is Oyster 01 Bravo. I remember thinking, Oyster. We don't have an Oyster call sign today. Then we realized. <laughs> That's Roger Locker. We answered him. That's exactly what he said. He said, guys, I've been down here a long time. Any chance of picking me up? <laughs> Pretty cool, huh? I don't believe I'd have been that cool after 22 days, do you? We said, you bet. You bet. Went back to our respective bases that afternoon, quickly planned a rescue mission. We came back in. He was five miles off the end of the runway at Yen Bai Airfield, some 60 miles northwest of Hanoi. The deepest rescue ever attempted. But the ground fire from around Yen Bai was so heavy that we had to back off. We couldn't get him out. Went home that night. As you can imagine, we're pretty down, pretty frustrated. This is our friend. This is some, someone most of us knew very well. He was on his third combat tour, over 400 combat missions. Not only did we admire and respect him greatly, he was one of the neatest young men that many of us had ever met. And now we found him. After all this time, now we knew where he was, and we couldn't get him out. And of course, now they knew where he was. And very soon, he would be captured. Well, the next day, in one of the great examples of courageous leadership, General John Vogt, VOGT, the four-star commander of 7th Air Force in Saigon, in consultation with General Fred Wyan, the Army commander, canceled. Oh, canceled the entire strike mission to Hanoi and dedicated every single resource, including over 150 airplanes, to the rescue of Roger Locker. We went in for about two hours. We made sure that the guns at Yen Bai Airfield were silenced. Then a young 27-year-old Air Force Academy graduate, Captain Dale Stovall, class of 67, 
commanded the lead of two Jolly Green Giant helicopters. And I'm always so proud to tell this story because you see Dale was a freshman when I was a senior at the Air Force Academy. Well, you guessed it. I had quite a bit to do with his summer training program his first year. <laughs> Dale commanded the lead of those two Jolly Greens, came in the PJs, sent the jungle penetrator down through a heavy canopy of trees, and snatched Roger Locker as he was about to be captured. Selected full power, pulled him out of the jungle into the helicopter. They headed out. We flew cover for the two Jolly Greens, their C-130 refueling tankers as they made their way out of North Vietnam. Brought him all the way back to Udorn, Thailand. General Vogt flew up from T in a T-39 from Saigon was the first of several hundred of us to meet him as he stepped off that chopper after 23 days. The flight surgeons, the doctors, the nurses, the medics, the chaplains quickly took him off to the hospital. But they did say he could come to the club that night, 1900 hours, 7 p.m. for 30 minutes, and the word spread. And the club was totally jam-packed. And at 7 p.m., Roger Locker, washed, dressed, shaven, and dressed in a uniform that we used to call our party suit. Walked in the front door. Applause broke out that lasted for over 20 minutes. As he made his way through the crowd, taking hands with friends. A magnificent experience of human emotion. An incredible victory. A total force joint rescue victory against all odds with no losses. And when we think about that and analyze it and compare it, say, to the theme of that movie, Platoon, we suggested that we shoot each other in the back and then we come to fully understand the effort to which we will go, the resources we will commit, the risk that we will take to rescue one crew member, one American, one ally. Isn't it a very powerful statement about what kind of people we are, about the value that we place on life, on freedom, and on the individual, and about the marketplace in which we all operate? which is defined by tremendous respect for the individual and for economic freedom. Of course, as you well know, without economic freedom, we ultimately lose all other freedoms. You see, this is what I believe it's about. The real mission, yours and mine, business, government, civilian, military, is to protect and preserve an environment, a climate, a system, a way of life where people can be free to reach their full potential. As our friends in the Army used to say, be all that they can be. You know, I think I like that one better than, what the heck, it was, uh, it was uh, Army strong for a while, wasn't it? Where, where are the Army folks? It was Army strong, right? Army of one, I never understood that. I thought we were a team. And then the Air Force went to above and beyond or cross into the blue. No, wasn't. wait a minute. Uh, cross into the blue, above and beyond, and now they're back to aim high, fly, fight, and win, which I love. Because I suspect I'm like some of you. I'm just hopelessly old-fashioned. Of course, we could use a few of those old-fashioned virtues and values these days, couldn't we? You know, the ones that are not very hip, not popular in Hollywood, not popular in the social circles, uh, not popular in Washington. Uh, those old-fashioned values, hard work, teamwork, responsibility, integrity, the values that built us, the values that made us, the values that resulted in the highest standard of living for the greatest number of people in all of history, those old-fashioned values. 
Okay, I'm just about finished. There's John Madden. Good looking guy, isn't he? Where's my pointer, John? Isn't that John right there? Isn't that John? Huh? Right there with Triple, our mascot. It was Triple, wasn't it, John? Yeah, Triple, Triple Knuckle, of course, 555th Fighter Squadron. So, there he is. The man that made it possible for Steve Ritchie to be a fighter ace. Oh, gosh. You know, you know, that, I don't know, they made us put those darn stars all over the place. <laughs> John didn't have any yet. Huh? <laughs> did you? You didn't have yours yet, did you, John? So, um, you can see I took those off and, <laughs> and <laughs> calmed that thing down a little bit. But that is the same suit. That was, uh, I don't know. I don't know when that was. So, you know, uh, fighter pilots are a lot like Italians and Romanians. As long as we can use our hands, we can just keep on going. So I could do this all day, but let's get to the best part. Doug mentioned that Mariana grew up in Romania under communism, dreaming of, uh, go. It's a good shot to end on. Dreaming of what it might be like to be free. Dreaming of the American military and hoping that someday they would come to rescue her. First, I have to start by saying that um, we were supposed to be in Phoenix. We cut our trip short. Uh, we were supposed to attend NASCAR tomorrow. We gave it up to be here. And um, for a lady that is behind who put together all this program, and her name is Paula Clark, and I'd like to thank her for making possible uh, for all of us to be here and honor our veterans since <laughs> since the museum didn't have a veterans day program this year so this will make up for it um, at first sight i'm just uh, general's little wife but beyond that i am the american that you rescued and the i'm the oppressed that you've rescued, and the American who fights alongside you to keep our freedom from slipping through our fingers. While American children were learning to love and trust themselves, we learned to hate, trust no one, control every word we said, because our life depended on it. We grew up waiting in line for hours, sometimes even days, for a piece of bread. The communists believed in spreading the wealth, take from the ones who have and give to the poor. And that paralyzed the economy because those who had didn't want to work anymore when it was all taken away from them. And the poor didn't want to work because they were getting something for nothing. And that only lasted until they ran out of other people's money. I never understood how do you multiply wealth by dividing it? How do you multiply anything by dividing it? The communists um, were big spenders, and they tried to fix the spending problem by throwing even more money at the problem, which did not work at all. They kept printing money. And when I, grew, when I asked a teacher in class, how do you spend your way out of debt, I was told to sit down, shut up, and obey. Obeying was never one of my strengths. 
um, guns were illegal because unarmed people were easier to control and oppress. Knowing that my grandfather was a priest, I was threatened with all kinds of things for going to church. And that only made me go to church even more. And it was not courage. It was despair. I wanted to provoke them, to make them do whatever it was that they needed to do and get it done and over with. We couldn't say Merry Christmas. We had to say Happy Holidays. We couldn't say Christmas trees. We had to say holiday trees. God was not allowed in schools or anywhere else. The socialist healthcare killed many. One of the, my first memories as a child was holding the hand of a dying man who was a friend and a neighbor, and my grandmother crying, saying, there's nothing more we can do for him but help him die. And I can still feel his hand getting cold and stiff in my hand. And the look of death in his eyes is still haunting me. When I asked my grandmother how old I was, she said I was five years old. All he needed was a simple surgery that here in America is an outpatient surgery. And back there, he died for nothing. Through all this madness, um, we felt forgotten even by God at times. But there was one constant hope that never left us. The hope that American troops are going to come and blow us up. Blow up every board, every brick, every wall, until there was nothing left standing. You see, we were part of a system that was so evil and so corrupt that we didn't feel we were worth saving either. And we would have given anything in exchange for freedom. All the gold in the mountains, all the oil in southern Romania, we would have given the Americans our heart and soul. You see, the oppressed never judge, it's the last to judge the rescuers. And the oppressed understands better than anyone else that the rescuers have to do whatever they have to do. And nobody likes war, just like nobody likes surgery. But sometimes you have no choice. I am free today, along with millions of other people, because Americans went to war. As a little girl, I did not dream of Prince Charming coming on a white horse to carry me off to his castle. I knew I needed a lot more than that. I needed an American fighter pilot that would come and blow up everything, fly me to America in a fighter jet. And I still can't believe that I found him. <laughs> Sometimes I'm, I'm afraid I'll wake up and, and realize it was all just a dream. Um, I had a picture of an American flag that I had cut out of a foreign magazine smuggled into the country because all information that was coming in was very much controlled by the government. And at times I would take it out and stare at it trying to imagine and dream of America, dream of what it would be like to be free, to walk in Central Park. I'd imagine what a hamburger tastes like, or cheesecake. I made the mistake to take it to class, and um, I got caught. And I knew the teacher would come to, to destroy it. So I hid the flag. And in spite of all the threats, I did not surrender the American flag. I could afford to lose my life because it had no meaning without freedom. But I couldn't afford to live without that hope. And that's all I had. And then years later, I'm in America, and I watch some Americans burn their own flag on TV. And that hurt more than anything that has been done to me under communism. 
because I expected the communists to be evil. I just did not expect to see evil here. And I realized that it's not against the law to burn the flag. But I also want you to know that evil, I come from a world where evil prevailed because good people did nothing. Please don't let that happen here because there's nowhere else to go. This is it. This is as good as it gets. I've been all over the world now. And there's no better place than America. America is the greatest country in the world. And I don't care whose feelings that hurts. What about our feelings as Americans? You know, we worry about everybody else's feelings. What about us? Let's remember that our country was not built on apologies. We, by the time we came to America, uh, we were numb. We are not dead, but we've never really been alive either. And um, we went through New York, spent one night in New York, but the plane had to circle. We couldn't land right away. And um, all of a sudden, I noticed that the plane's leaving New York. It felt like it was going away. And I panicked. I really believed the, the communists would play these mind games, and I believed them capable of flying us all the way to New York, only to take us back. And I was not going to go back. So I unbuckled the seatbelt, and I looked at the emergency exit door. And if that airplane wasn't going to go back towards New York, I would have jumped, because I'd rather be dead in America than live anywhere else. And I will never forget seeing the New York skyline and the Statue of Liberty with the Twin Towers. Um, it was one of the most amazing experiences in my life. And New York was everything I ever imagined and more. All the skyscrapers, so shiny, um, all glass, steel, marble, the fancy cars, the, the abundant food. There was more food in the pet aisle for pets than it was in my hometown back in Romania, which is the second largest city in Romania. Um, the fancy shoes, the jewelry. I haven't seen diamonds till I came to America. And we had nothing. We had a bag of clothes. We didn't speak English. and. Um, We were not bitter. We were not envious. We were happy and proud to be a small part of a country that can make such wondrous things. And all those things were a promise that someday we can have all that. And we do now in the most amazing way. We were outcasts in our own country. And you took us in. And you gave us a second chance to life. And you taught us the meaning of new words, like kindness, and love, and happiness. We, um, after a, a day in New York, we came to Seattle. And lived in Seattle for 25 years. And we were overwhelmed by people's kindness. We've been offered jobs, never really had to look for a job. American people are the kindest people in the world. They were kinder to me than my own people back in Romania. And um, I, I've somehow I've become one of them. When people ask me where I'm from because of my ask, accent, I say, Seattle. <laughs> well, that's not a Seattle accent. And then I remember, oh, yes, that's right. <laughs> and um, learned to love the Seahawks. Um, 
two years ago, we were in, living in Florida, and Steve is a Bronco fan, and I'm a, yes, Seahawk fan. And we were watching the Super Bowl together, and our friends were feeling sorry for us. And um, they were offering to pay for marriage counseling. <laughs> but it wasn't necessary because the Seahawks won the Super Bowl. So we were fine. Everything was fine. <laughs> But um, I would like to give you the point of view of the oppressed. In spite of my, what you might hear on TV, America is not hated all over the world. There are millions of oppressed people who are hoping you can go there next and free them. You are so loved all over the world. And yes, some governments hate us. So what? Take it as a compliment. It means we stand for something. It takes guts. And let's not forget that our country was built on breaking rules and laws. The laws that did, that did not do us justice. We, the people, existed first. We created everything there is, our country. We built this. And then we created the government. The government did not create us. We are not here for the government. The government is here for us. The worst forms of oppression is that at the hands of your own people, your own government. Why? Because it's disguised and it's very hard to identify. It's disguised as your friend, you know, I'm doing this, I'm taking this freedom away from you because it's in your best interest. Because I will be there for you, protecting you. But there's no way anybody out there in the government, a complete stranger, can ever take care of you or your family as well as if you were doing it yourself. If you were allowed the freedom to do it yourself. You can give yourself more than any other person government in this world could ever give you. The oppressed does not look at America as rich or poor, Republican or Democrats, black or white. The oppressed only knows one thing, American rescuers. And that's all that matters to them. That's all that matters to the world. The world's a better place because Americans are in it. And I know we've heard nothing but bad, negative comments about Vietnam. But with every move Americans made in Vietnam, we, behind the Iron Curtain, felt the Soviet grip lose, lose its strength. And it gave us time to breathe and stay alive. Because you kept the Soviets busy in Vietnam. They lost track of us. And there's no more Soviet Union. There's no more evil empire, thanks to America. I would like to put a face to the oppressed people from all over the world and say thank you. Thank you for everything you've sacrificed for not just our country, but the world. Thank you for everything you're doing and you will be doing. The world is a better place. It does make a huge difference. I know in your dark, darkest moments, you're wondering if it's all worth it. And I have to say, oh yes, it's so worth it. You're appreciated more than you can ever imagine. Thank you, God bless you, and God bless America.